Good morning, everyone. I think it's nine o'clock, so let's get started. I want to welcome you all to the third and final day of 2020 Age Positive Revision. For those who have been with us the last couple of days, welcome back. And for those of you who are just joining us today, we're really glad to have you. Uh, my name is Linda Redford. I'm the director of the Link for Care Resource Project at the University of Kansas Medical Center and also a research associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine there. Um, I'm also a member of this year's Age Positive Planning Committee. So we're very pleased to see all of you on board here today. Um, it's my pleasure to moderate and to present at this workshop called Resources to Help Navigate Through the Pandemic. Our previous sessions informed us about the prevalence and negative outcomes associated with social isolation and loneliness, as well as introduced us to some innovative strategies and programs to help our own programmatic initiatives. This workshop will introduce you to a number of resources that we hope will be helpful to both you and your constituents. Uh, before I introduce the presenters, I do have a couple housekeeping tips. Um, there will be time for questions following the presentations. We will keep track of the questions in the chat function and relay these to the presenters. I would note that it will be very helpful if you will indicate the speaker your question is directed to. So for example, you could say, Tom, uh, how can I get an inexpensive computer? The questions uh, will be done after all three presentations. Uh, please also use the chat for adding in any additional comments you have. Uh, during the session, it's important that we share and learn from each other during this, this presentation and this session. Um, this presentation will be recorded. The recording, PowerPoint, and the chat conversations will be made available within about two weeks following this conference. It's my pleasure now to introduce the speakers for this workshop. We have Tom Esselman, the Executive Director of PCs for People Kansas City, which was formerly Connecting for Good. We also have Dr. James Stowe, who's the Director of Aging and Adult Services for the Mid-America Regional Council. And the third speaker will be me. So uh, Tom, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Linda. Hello, everybody. Uh, happy to be here today, uh, celebrating a great Chiefs victory for those of you who are Chiefs fans and, uh, and hoping that um, you all can uh, get a lot of useful tips and information out of what we're about to present. Uh, as Linda said, I'm the executive director of PCs for People in Kansas City. Um, for the last eight years, we've been known as Connecting for Good, uh, and we joined PCs for People, which is a more nationally based nonprofit. Uh, and uh, you'll learn more about that in the course of the uh, 10 minutes or so that I'm gonna speak with you. And the topic for me today has to do with the term that I've been living in for the last four and a half years. It's called digital inclusion. Uh, you may have heard of the term, the digital divide. Um, and, uh, and we're gonna go through how that's affecting seniors and older adults uh, during this pandemic. Uh, this next slide shows, I mean, it's a topic right now that has gotten more uh, attention than it has in the past eight or 10 years, particularly for older adults. Um, this particular quote um, I really like this because um, it kind of sums up where we're at right now. Um, if you go back one slide real quick, um, I just want to focus on that quote. Crises do not create inequity and fault lines in society. They expose them. Um, and I think what we've seen ever since the coronavirus has hit is that this um, phenomenon of, of people who are living without access to home technology and the skills to use it. Um, uh, it's always been around, but it's never gotten that much attention from most of us who take for granted uh, that we've got access to affordable internet and computers and computer skills. But this pandemic has really put a spotlight, uh, particularly for older adults, on the, the effects of the digital divide. You can go to the next slide now. Um, uh, and and this, this quote really got my attention out of the UK um, because there's, there's research studies which are starting to emerge even within the four to six months that we've been going through this crisis that really put a, a premium on trying to solve this digital divide issue 
because of the way it's accentuated the vulnerability uh, of older adults when it comes to loneliness and social isolation. So if you go to the next slide, um, I decided that for my comments, I wanna get a little bit personal with you guys. This is my mom and dad uh, from a couple of years ago uh, when we were visiting uh, my brother and his wife in Washington, DC. Uh, uh, at the time, they were in their mid eighties. Uh, right now, my mom, uh, who's on the right is 88 and my dad passed away uh, a, a little over a year and a half ago. And uh, the reason I bring that up is because my mom who spent her life with my dad. They were married for 67 years uh, before he passed. Um, you know, she's had trouble making decisions um, without him around. And she's still living by herself in the same house that I grew up in with them. And uh, it got so bad about three months ago, um, she was telling me that she didn't even want to turn on her air conditioner because she was worried that if it broke, um, she wouldn't be allowed to have a repairman come into the house. Um, she at one point didn't even want to turn on her oven uh, because of that fear. Uh, now, since then, uh, fortunately, I have brothers and sisters that have talked to her. She hasn't allowed any one of us to physically come into the house to visit her. Um, but um, she's gotten better and she's gotten less fearful. Um, but I just wanted to point that out because I'm sure so many of you have your own personal experiences about how this pandemic has accentuated the, the fears of older adults. And if they're without, um, you know, computers and the skills to use them, it even accentuates their isolation. So if you go to the next slide, um, the question kind of raises itself about, you know, how can we help elderly family members. Um, that's just kind of a focused question. Um, but just keeping them in touch um, is kind of one of the biggest things that I, I know that any of us, whether it's in our jobs or in our personal lives, we grapple with all the time. Um, so one example I want to give you of something that happened in Kansas City, if you go to the next slide, um, is this idea of finding affordable devices to make sure um, that the uh, um, senior older adults in your lives at least have a device that uh, is not going to cost them a lot of money. Um, and uh, starting in uh, March, PCs for People, at that time it was still known as Connecting for Good, we were overwhelmed with demand, um, both from um, families with students because of the effect on um, schools going to remote learning, but it was just as pronounced among senior living facilities and agencies that work with a lot of homebound seniors. So fortunately, we had a great uh, opportunity. If you go to the next slide, a local foundation, um, uh, which was actually brought to my attention uh, by Kathy boyer um, with, uh with the Kansas City Communities for All Ages here at Mark. Um, and it's the Gould Charitable Foundation. And they, they spent time with me. They understood what PCs for People does to help provide affordable devices to people. And they provided a grant that enabled us to get uh, 50 computers each to Shepherd Center Central, Jewish Family Services, and the Palestine Senior Citizen Activity Center. So within about six weeks, we distributed and provided IT support for 150 homebound seniors through these three agencies. And the cost was totally taken care of by this grant uh, from this wonderful, wonderful foundation. Um, so how is it that we can provide those affordable devices? If you go to the next slide, um, here is a, a picture of me uh, along with uh, uh, Meiji Benson, one of our warehouse workers. Um, and what PCs for People does um, is we, we, we got ourselves certified in the safe destruction of data, which is on most computers. And that enabled us to go to businesses and local governments and organizations large and small who have um, what we call retiring IT assets, IT assets that are no longer being used by those businesses or organizations. And rather than throw them away, uh, which hurts the environment, or rather than uh, negotiating with a for-profit recycler 
uh, we're able to present an option where for no fee, we collect those, those old computers and electronics, we recycle what we can't use, but we refurbish, we, we wipe the data and we add new hard drives uh, and we, we get them ready so that they can then be redistributed um, to the community that needs them. So if you go to the next slide, um, you can understand that in addition to providing devices, it's really important we've learned through the years and what Connecting for Good really made its name um, off of was the idea that if, if you have access to affordable internet and a device, it's not going to do you any good unless you have a way to learn how to use those computers. Um, and this is a, a wonderful photograph of a wonderful lady that many of you hopefully have gotten to meet through the years, Carol Myers. Uh, she started working for Connecting for Good years ago as a volunteer. And five years ago, we put her on staff and she manages our computer center over at the old Linwood Presbyterian Church. Um, may, and mainly what she does is she teaches classes or provides one-on-one -on -one mentoring for other older adults uh, who come to our center. They either live in the neighborhood and walk there or we're on two bus lines. We're right off of 71 Highway at Linwood Boulevard. So it's a very accessible place um, for, uh, for older adults that, that live within the city to get there. And she provides training on everything from the basics of a computer all the way up to more advanced technical skills. And you can see that's her little dog, Ramey. Um, who is kind of our therapy dog. Um, and just, just having this, uh, this woman who, by the way, happens to be 83 years old. She just uh, had her birthday. Um, and she just runs circles around all of us. Um, and uh, she's also someone who was uh, celebrated as one of the 70 over 70 uh, by Shepherd Center Central, uh, which is a great initiative they started a few years ago. Uh, we're thrilled to have Carol working with us, but she provides such essential training. And we do that throughout the city in, uh, in various places that have free access computer labs. If you go to the next slide, um, you'll see that in addition to the training we provide, uh, we, we have noticed that young people are also great teachers of digital skills to their parents and older adults. This is a a photograph of uh, some of our staff members uh, helping the woman who needed to learn skills by getting a computer to her son who could teach her, uh, especially during this pandemic, because he was forced to do all his schoolwork at home, but she wanted to be able to help him, but didn't know how to use a computer. So she was able to get with us and work with both her son and our staff to help her feel more comfortable. If you go to the next slide, um, uh, I just wanted to point out that what we do here is not unique to Kansas City. In fact, there is an organization that's probably gotten more attention and more deserved acclaim for its work with seniors and, and helping them how to learn technology skills than pretty much anyone in the country. Um, and that's called the Older Adults Technology Service, OATS. Uh, and in particular, they refer to their program as Senior Planet. Uh, and this was a, a recent article about uh, some work that Senior Planet does. And I think we have in the next slide a little bit more information that I think you guys should, should take to heart uh, about understanding and learning more about what Senior Planet is. Uh, this is their website, uh, seniorplanet.org. And they provide a tremendous amount of online resources that can help any of you who are working with older adults when it comes to ways that you can help them not only get access to technology, but more importantly, online curriculum and, and training tips for teaching older adults how to make the most out of technology resources. If you go to the next slide, um, I, I again refer back to a lot of learning I get from work that's happening over in the UK, um, there is uh, actually a service that has been set up that's designed to help make it easier for anyone who has older adults in their family or uh, in their circle of influence or friends uh, to help make it easier for them. It's not, they don't have Senior Planet in the UK, 
uh, but they do have some really helpful online resources, particularly that focus on video chat through Skype and other means. And I think if you go to the next slide, I, uh, I put some more information about it. They've created a program called Digital Buddy. And I'm not gonna show you this video, but um, if, you, if you get a chance to Google um, a Digital Buddy or Age UK and Digital Buddy, you'll see this is a wonderful program for helping to teach anyone who wants to volunteer to help uh, a homebound senior or an older adult who has access to a computer and internet, but needs help walking them through the skills required to use a computer. Um, so I wanted to make sure you had access to that as a resource. Next slide, please. Uh, I just wanted to share with you um, to reinforce what I was saying about the importance of video chats. Going back to my parents um, and the difficulty that my mom has had overcoming her fears, one of the things that my youngest sister who lives in California did to help my mom who lives in Kentucky uh, was to teach her over the phone how to use her computer and actually sent her an iPad uh, and walked her through the steps to help make it easier for my mom to stay in touch with my siblings and me and our kids. Uh, and in my case, even uh, my grandkids who are her great grandkids. Um, and it did wonders to help make her feel co more comfortable just about living her life. Um, and in the next slide, uh, I make reference to some um, really important research that has just come out about the critical importance of video chat uh, as, as a tool that is demonstrated that it's, it's mitigating the effect of loneliness and isolation and even symptoms of depression among seniors. Um, if you, uh, I don't know if you can write this down or, or make note of this, we'll, we'll make these slides available, but this is where I found this. It's a, uh, it's a website and a, uh, a foundation called McKnight's Long-Term Care News. Uh, but this was a really important uh, research study. I don't know if I put another slide on there or not. I don't think I did. Uh, but if you, if you go to the next slide, um, I, I wanted to bring us back into uh, you know, what we have available here locally in Kansas City as well. And there's, there's two um, websites I wanna bring to your attention. Uh, and they highlight two sets of activities that we're doing here locally. Um, one is a group that I've been a part of ever since Connecting for Good was started um, and about eight years ago. We wound up creating a coalition of organizations called the Kansas City Coalition for Digital Inclusion. We have a website, digitalinclusionkc.org. Uh, the president of the coalition is the deputy director of the Kansas City Public Library, Carrie Coogan. Uh, who many of you may know from her time as a, a reporter on Fox 4 TV. She was a radio host with Johnny Dare, uh, and then she was executive director of Literacy KC for a while, and for the last five years she's been deputy director at the library. The Kansas City Public Library just has a wealth of resources, and so serving as president of the coalition, um, she and the library have done a great job of coalescing all the agencies that make it easier for anyone who's trying to, to um, provide resources to help seniors learn more about access to technology and skills. And more recently, thanks to the work of the uh, University of Missouri at Kansas City, uh, there has been created a website. Uh, it's called mobroadband.org. It's the Missouri Broadband Resource Rail. Um, and it's only been started for the last six months or so, but it is growing every day and it's an online resource tool for any area throughout the state of Missouri uh, that is developing and creating access to resources um, that help any individuals, um, you know, not the least of whom would be seniors and older adults, uh, get access to affordable internet and devices and training resources and, and help to make it easier to access techn technology. So I don't think I have any more slides. Um, I, I went through that quickly, um, but I wanna make sure that if, if you all know, if you ever have any questions, even beyond this session, 
uh, please feel free to email me, uh, T. Esselman at PCsforpeople.org. Uh, you can go to the PCs for People website, and, and our phone number there is our main line. Uh, we would be more than happy to help in any way that we can. Um, so I'm going to Whew, just take a breath there. My time is over, but uh, it's just the first phase of some helpful uh, resources. And I'm going to turn over now uh, to my colleague and, uh, as you heard before, the uh, Director of Aging and Adult Services at Mark, James Stowe, who's going to give you more information on resources to help seniors uh, access technology and services during the pandemic. James, I'll hand it over to you. Tom, thanks so much. Uh, and I just want to point out uh, what a, an asset we have in Tom and PCs for people in the Kansas City region. He's a, a humble man, but uh, what a, an astounding organization. And if the importance of that work uh, wasn't highlighted before, which it was, it's even more evident now. So thanks, uh, thanks Tom. Um, so I do direct the Department of Aging and Adult Services at the Mid-America Regional Council. It's a designated area agency on aging. And a function of area agencies on aging is to handle uh, referrals and inquiries into resources in the community. So we have uh, quite a bit of contact um, in relationship with uh, organizations that have call centers and, and welcome people into older adult uh, resources. And we have some experience in that, in that realm. Uh, so I really wanna to talk today about as those referrals have been surging during the pandemic, um, how we as frontline professionals in aging uh, kind of take that referral into the appropriate depth and then find organizations that can handle uh, the complexity of the cases that we're encountering. Uh, so you can proceed to the next one, please. Uh, so we, uh, we often get uh, folks into our systems who are just calling for meals. It's a very common call. Uh, it's probably our most common call that changes month to month. It might be transportation as it is in many uh, regions, but meals is a, a pretty common call. Uh, but what we find, is, as is natural with older people, um, heading into advanced age, living with chronic conditions, acquiring uh, conditions that are leading to dysfunction, if you are at the point where it's difficult to access um, and create meals uh, in your home, just kind of think for a minute what that means about other areas of your life and function. And typically it means that you've entered a phase of complexity of functioning in your home that would go beyond meals. It might extend uh, to many domains of life. Uh, but people don't, you know, no one knows social health and social services. As, a, as an ordinary person on the street, there's just not a lot of knowledge about those type of resources. So as people enter the need for that type of support in advancing age, uh, you know, no one knows what care management is. Uh, it's very rare for us to encounter any client who has an awareness of what a care manager could do for them and how they could really engage them in an in-depth way to understand their needs, uh, develop a care plan, and help people achieve goals uh, with social health resources around the, the region that are just unknown and not, not commonly advertised and not commonly consumed. Um, so really, that is the case that we find um, the people who really need the support the most to thrive in the community independently, these are complex cases. Um, a, a point that illustrates this is if you think about dementia diagnosis um, in primary care settings, uh, we know from a variety of research studies that not early dementia, but dementia that's actually presenting in a, in a moderate uh, to minor way in the lives of individuals in the community, that's oftentimes missed by the primary care physician up to 53%, uh, some studies think. I mean, just think about having that treatment of a person face-to-face -face with your primary care family physician, and they miss that diagnosis, even when it's moderately impacting your life. And so again, when people call for meals, we would, as social health professionals, you easily miss the underlying complexity in people's lives, just like dementia is uh, missed by these highly trained professionals in primary care settings. Um, during the pandemic, I've had the, uh, the fortune to be out in the community uh, delivering meals. I know many of my colleagues across uh, the state of Missouri and Kansas, um, states of Missouri and Kansas, have also been doing uh, frontline service, trying to react to the surge and demand that we've had. And I came across a couple in the community, and they had, they had been signed up for home-delivered meals. 
uh, through their adult child. And they, they kind of identified that as a need. Um, but as I got talking with this couple uh, from a, a safe distance and with masks on, it became evident that they, they had a depth of need in their lives uh, where a care manager could come in and really connect them to falls prevention, uh, transportation resources, some socialization activities and caregiver support activities um, that I, in my estimation would have made a profound difference in their, their situation. Uh, but again, communicating that and the value of it, uh, you know, I wasn't able, unfortunately, to communicate the value of a care manager and how that resource would help them in their situation. And they said, oh, we, we have uh, counseling of all types. Uh, <laughs> like, well, it's not really counseling, uh, but they didn't sign up. Uh, but it was evident that that complexity was existent in their lives. And I, I, I think it is uh, throughout many of the people that we interact with who come to us with just one discrete need. All right, we can go on to the next slide, please. So as you're uh, working with folks and either taking in referrals from the community or making them out to, uh, to other organizations, um, I just wanted to highlight some of the, the things that we have observed as hallmarks of complexity in cases that, that will give you some hint, some uh, red flags that these folks need kind of wrap around face-to-face -face, uh, type of intervention. Um, and the first, of course, is easy. And we, we probably all are aware, if you, are you starting to add up complexities, either social or medical, um, then that person probably needs a little bit more in-depth referral to a, a more robust agency with wraparound services available. Um, also, if you get a call for meals and it's just someone from their neighborhood in the street and the uh, professionals are not making that request of your organization, then there probably is some complexity in that individual's life. Because of that factor that I mentioned earlier, no one knows about social resources in depth or social health uh, interventions that might help them. So they hear about Meals on Wheels, they pick up the phone and they make that one call. But um, oftentimes you'll have a professional who has fully assessed the need. They're trying to get one distinct service initiated um, and they're calling for that specific reason. Um, but let's not overplay uh, how professionals, how aware professionals are of uh, social health and social needs. They don't always uh, have the full picture. So you do have to exercise some caution. Um, so Gestalt, it's a, this is a funny thing. So uh, as frontline professionals with aging, you know, we kind of get an intuition, a, a whole picture of the person that we're serving. And uh, that's oftentimes really right. So if you think there's something further, if, if you get hints from the conversation that there is more complexity, there's more needs than what the person is just asking for, um, follow that intuition, uh, make that referral to a, a more robust service line or a, attempt to motivate the, the client to have a, a wraparound assessment. And uh, in the driving uh, field, I, I used to do uh, driving research and safety for older adults. It was found that, you know, these very robust validated instruments to measure driving function, they actually weren't as reliable as a clinician's gestalt about that person and their inability to drive. So the, the clinician and just their face-to-face -face interaction was able to predict driving impairment, impairment uh, better in many cases than some of these instruments that relied, were relied upon to, uh, to measure that. Um, also, it, I hope that uh, most people know, know this fact or have observed it, the face-to-face -face or, or video-to-video and encounter with folks is uh, just a, a, a good teen off point for observing complexities in lives uh, that we wouldn't otherwise uh, know or see. Um, and th this reminds me of a case that we processed at Mark um, where uh, an individual was referred into our systems for you know, some pretty distinct problems. And we had a, a really skilled care manager uh, go to speak with a gentleman in his home uh, do a face-to-face -face assessment. And uh, yeah, I admire the care manager's uh, professionalism and an ability to look at the details and look at the depth of the case. And she noticed that while going over some paperwork, this individual was, was squinting, you know, the papers. And um, she inquired further and, and probed a little bit further with this uh, gentleman and found out that he had an uncorrected vision impairment and had been living with that for 40 years in the community. I mean, in fact, that vision impairment was so severe and so pervasive that it led to illiteracy. And through that uh, very astute observation, watching the client carefully face-to-face -face while doing an assessment, uh, she 
grasped onto that very treatable issue. And in, in fact, um, in addition to many other issues on his care plan, was able to get him uh, glasses and correct that vision problem. Um, and who knows, maybe today he's on the way to literacy because of that astute care manager. Um, and then always, uh, even when facing complexity, social and medical complexities, we encourage um, every frontline professional to offer options and choices to older people, uh, not be patronizing, let them make poor decisions in our estimation because they are adults and that's, I would want that freedom to make a poor decision. And we try to just uh, offer them the best resources available, give our professional input, um, but of course it's never, never forcing. Okay, we can go to the next one. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about the result of that interaction and identifying the complexity that you may encounter with clients. Um, if we come across someone with, you know, you've kind of isolated them as non-complex and have a really distinct need, resource databases are a great place to send those folks or single service line organizations that are, are going to resolve whatever that need is. That's a really appropriate referral for kind of these simple uh, single service line cases. Um, but then be aware when you do encounter those hallmarks of complexity, you have assessed this client to have diverse needs that are a little bit deeper than they may have presented at first encounter. Uh, that's where, of course, we would encourage a care manager to get involved. Um, an organization that has face-to-face -face assessment available or video-to-video -video assessment available, if possible, um, or and of course wraparound services, so that as those complex needs emerge during the, the encounter with the client, um, the organization has the ability to wrap those around and really uh, give the client what they need. Um, so those are some important things to focus on um, if you do identify complex and diverse needs in the clients that you are encountering. Um, so that's kind of a, an overview of what we see um, as an area agency on aging and what I've encountered in a lot of assessment uh, with older people uh, where they they might present for that one meal that they're calling for, but there's a lot of complexity to human lives below that um, and a lot more that we can do and offer folks uh, where they may not have been aware of, uh, of what's even available to them. Um, and like Tom, I'm more than happy after the uh, after this session is over, contact me at any time at that email address um, with questions or if you just want to engage. Um, and I do want to thank everyone for their, their time and attention. Uh, next, we are going to uh, turn to Dr. Linda Redford. Uh, so Dr. Linda Redford is at the Landon Center on Aging, um, an extreme force in the aging community in Kansas City. And it's uh, with extreme pleasure that uh, I want to welcome Dr. Redford. Thank you, James. That was a very good presentation. And uh, Tom also. Um, I just wanted to add on the sidelight, um, that there are some bright spots in this COVID situation and technology being available in that uh, I'm using video chat a lot now more than I want to as far as my work life goes, but um, also connecting with about 15 of my cousins who are spread out across the country. And we've always sort of made these assumptions that, well, one of these days, We'll, we'll see and we'll be traveling through that part of the country or something and see them. And now I think we're all recognizing, well, we don't know when this may occur and maybe we better get in touch with each other. And so we're all visiting with each other now on, um, on Zoom chats. Um, and some of us haven't really connected previously for years uh, to be together. So it, it does have a few bright sides. Um, you will notice on this slide, my email address is on here. So just uh, be aware of that, that you, you can get my email address. And I, like James, welcome any kind of contact or ideas or suggestions or anything that you might have um, anytime after this presentation. Uh, next slide. Okay. I'm going to be talking about resources. A lot of people uh, do not really have case managers. They don't, they're not hooked into our uh, social service systems, our healthcare systems, and so forth in ways that they have any contact with social workers, case managers, or otherwise. And uh, many are pretty self-sufficient. So um, this presentation is on the way that people can find resources on their own and get assistance if they need it. Um, 
when you're going out to find resources, you're going to find that there are a lot, a lot of things out there, a lot of resource directories, um, a lot of information sections that you could turn to that will tell you about what are available in your community. Um, in fact, it's somewhat mind boggling. Some of these <clears throat> are very general, cover all age groups. Others are designed for older adults, some for children, such for, some for disadvantaged populations. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, others are issue oriented. So we have a lot of sites up there right now about COVID, everything from the dashboards to tell us how bad it is in our communities, um, to information on how we reopen, to how you wear a mask, you name it. Um, there are also certainly um, so, so sources out there and websites that are specific to housing, to healthcare, mental health, addiction services, transportation, and the list goes on and on. Okay, next slide. So when you're looking for a resource directory or when you're looking for something, one of the things that it's important to look at is what the coverage area is. Are they covering mainly a city, a county, a zip code, a state, or the entire country? And some do try to cover the entire country. You'll usually find that they're not as comprehensive in the area. So comprehensiveness is another um, issue to look at, whether they cover the majority of the services in a given category in your area. Um, how often the information is updated. I know we go out and look at them fairly frequently to make sure we're not missing somebody or missing something that maybe someone else has picked up and we have it um, as part of our resource directory. And we find a lot of, of very outdated information. In fact, information that um, the particular provider doesn't even exist anymore. Um, how are the listings compiled and displayed? This also tells you a lot about how some of the uh, financing is for these or how they make decisions, but if they have a lot of very fancy listings with pictures and lots of things up front, those are probably providers that have actually paid to be on that site. Um, and it's more of an advertising feature. Search capabilities, um, the number of search categories that are available and how easily you can narrow your search down. Um, I remember when my parents were both ill many years ago, finding services was a nightmare because literally you had to go down the phone book or whatever resource directories were available in print at that time and then call all of them to narrow down your search. Whereas now we have the ability to narrow searches very quickly through search functions. And then also, of course, the accuracy of those searches. Uh, another real issue that I found that is sort of a bugaboo for me is do, are you required to disclose your identity? Um, on some of the sites that are basically marketing sites, you before you really get much information on anything, you are required to put in your name, your phone number, your email address and so forth, and then you will be hearing from them forever. Uh, so I know some of you have had that experience. Next slide. Okay, just to give you an idea of some of the resources that are out there and very relevant to our area, um, on the MARC website, you will see uh, a site called preparemetrokc.org. Uh, probably the easiest way to find this is to actually Google it. It's a little bit difficult to find um, on the MARC's website, but um, it's there. And this gives some of the uh, vision of the pages that are on there, but it tells you about preventing the spread. You can get help and give help. And then the public health resources, which is a listing of all the health departments in our um, multi-county region. The um, other aspects of it are weekly, weekly updates, weekly news. And on the other side are the resources that are available. Um, and you have the Mid-America Regional Council's Department of Aging and Adult Services, James, who just spoke, um, our Link for Care Project, the Johnson County Area Agency on Aging, which are all resources for people in our area. So you can easily click to those from the site. Um, next slide. And this is one, it's a YouTube channel for Prepare Metro KC. And here you can see uh, videos on how to wear a mask properly, which a lot of people need to know. 
Um, also on all sorts of other aspects of COVID. So we have videos, playlists, different channels you can go to, a lot of information out on this. And regrettably, we don't have time to go through all these today, um, but there's a lot of information out there. Okay, next slide. And this is another resource that's out on the Prepare Metro KC, which is a safe return, which talks about everything from safely riding public transportation to reopening uh, businesses and so forth. So it's a very, um, very good guide to have. Next slide. And this is one that's very specific to reopening plans for the region. And this is in relation to our schools and so forth and what, who is reopening, when they're reopening and what's required in order um, to participate in activities in those programs. Next slide. Okay, um, this is one of the resource hubs that's available for the Kansas City region through MARC. And this is one I was telling you about that gives you information about the current status of COVID in the area. And this is updated pretty much daily. Um, it will tell you the cases, how many tests have come back positive, deaths, and so forth. So it gives you a pretty good picture about what's going on in the region per se. Um, next slide. And then there is a Johnson County resource that also is very specific to Johnson County. Uh, and you also have uh, the dashboard on that site that's specific to Johnson County Regional Hospital data and a lot more information too about COVID. So uh, lots of resources out there to keep you updated on what's going on in your particular communities, um, but also the general resources uh, for helping us all keep safe during this time. Next. Okay. These are two, uh, and I spoke of resource directories. These are a couple of the resource directories that are available. A lot of you are very familiar with United Way 211 called My Resource Directory. Um, this directory allows you to enter either a zip code or to choose a county. Um, and then you can choose what particular categories of services you are looking for. And when you click on those, it will give you the ones that initially are for the closest to that county. The nice thing about 211 is they also actually provide um, a person, a live person, who can talk to you. Uh, so you can actually call the 211 number and get assistance from uh, a resource person on the other end of the line who can walk you through things or help you find things that you might not be able to find on the site. Uh, 211 services are pretty much restricted to the free or reduced cost services and not-for-profit. So you won't find much on there about um, housing, for example, 55 plus housing or assisted living or any of those things where there are very few not-for-profits. Not for um, on the other side of the page here is My Resource Connection. That's out of Johnson County. It's on the Johnson County government website. Pretty much the information on this is the same as 211 because a lot of the information is downloaded from 211. So just be aware of that. You, you can go to 211 and 211 is a little bit easier to navigate. But this is out there and it also does have additional information put out by the county specific to uh, services and resources and activities, events going on in the county. Okay, next. Okay, and this is a site um, I like to promote because it's the link for care site that we run to KU Med Center. Uh, this site has actually been funded by um, a number of different federal grants and local grants. And we have it as open to the public. It, we do not have a call center, although people do call us who want assistance with things and we will provide that, but we don't advertise that as a service since our staff is uh, pretty much dedicated to trying to keep this updated, add new providers, take off ones that have disappeared and so forth. Um, I'm gonna briefly at least walk you through um, just a little bit so you understand it. First of all, uh, if you hit the A to Z listing, 
you'll see that this lists basic all the categories that you can search on at this point in time. Uh, we actually have more. We have several other categories that are about to come online. We're waiting to make sure we have um, enough information on all of them to make it really helpful to you all. But this gives you an idea of what's currently out there. Okay, next. Um, okay, uh, and then just to give you an example of how the site is set up, this is, let's go to food and personal goods. Um, if we go to food pantries, you have both an, a basic search and an advanced search option. Um, the basic search allows you to search by county or city. And also we have added COVID service status to all of the services that we have listed. So you can find out who is closed until further notice so that you know um, you don't want to go to those food pantries right now because they're not operating. Um, you can go to the ones that you know have um, open with limited, with excuse me, service or, or hours that are limited, and most of them are in this category because the vast majority uh, have somehow changed their practices. They're not open for everyone to just come into the food pantry anymore. Um, Carmelia, could you just click on one of those um, for a second? Yeah. And once you click on a particular uh, service, you can then see much more information about the details. So exactly what their current status is in terms of COVID, what you have to do when they're open. Um, you can see, you can also get to their website. You can look at their service hours, who they serve, types of foods they serve. Um, eligibility requirements, what kind of documents are required, and so forth. So a lot more information at that level. On the advanced search, we won't go to that right now, but when you hit the advanced search, you're able to also search on a number of those things. So if you want one that has gluten-free food, for example, you'd be able to search just on that um, under advanced search. Okay, uh, let's go to the next thing. Okay, um, a couple others that I wanted to go over on healthcare services. Uh, I'm going to show you home healthcare. These are home healthcare agencies. These are the kinds of things that we have under home health. These are the kind of search functions that we have. Again, you can always search by county. Um, you can search by, again, service status based on COVID, and most all of the home health agencies are open. Um, can you go back just a second on that? Come on. Sorry, I should have. Okay. Uh, you can also look at the types of care they provide. So if you're looking for private duty or skilled nursing and therapy services, you can find out who provides any of those or do they also provide in-home non-medical services, which is also another category. And also we have specialty care. This isn't often as relevant for the public, but sometimes it is if there's behavioral issues. So will they even take people that have behavior management issues or it's particularly, this is a field that care managers use a lot because we have who will take ventilator care, who could does um, complex wound care, things like that. So those are things that care managers for people coming out of the hospital and so forth um, could be very concerned about. At any time uh, you want to see everyone on the listing without doing any filters, just don't click any of the filters, just hit the search category and you'll see every single provider that we have listed. So you can see there are a lot under just home health medical within our, and we cover about 21 counties. We uh, have definitely have a lot of information, most of the information for the nine county region, but are every day adding in more for some of our surrounding counties. Okay, next. The other area I wanted to go to was in-home services, and then I want to talk a little bit about what's the difference between home health care and in-home services. Um, yeah, just go back all the way back. Um, okay, now in-home services. Um, because there's a lot of confusion sometimes between the in-home non-medical care and home health care, and it's even more confusing because a lot some of these non-medical care agencies call themselves 
um, health, home health agencies. Um, and the basic difference, uh, just go to the, the next slide. Um, if we're talking about home health agencies, can you hit on, yeah, the next slide? Sorry, yeah, let's get out. Um, the home health care is, is generally what we call a skilled nursing service and they have skilled nurses, they have occupational physical therapy, speech, lots of different therapy services. They are, for the most part, many of them Medicare covered, so that if you're coming out of the hospital and need ongoing care, they will be covered by Medicare and or sometimes by Medicaid. Um, they also do provide some non-medical services that will help with activities of daily living like bathing, dressing, eating. Generally, these are provided by uh, trained home health aides under the supervision of a skilled nurse. And these services are generally provided in conjunction also with some of the skilled services, although many agencies also provide these for typically self-pay um, if the person is no longer eligible for Medicare or not eligible for Medicaid and they can get help in the home um, through these agencies. Next. Okay, in-home care or the non-medical care. These agencies provide assistance to persons who, again, need help with activities of daily living. They perform a very important function for those who want to stay in their home, but really need help with personal care. They need help with housekeeping, transportation, and other kinds of activities of daily living. The employees of these agencies may or may not, may be trained as aides, some may be personal care attendants. They may not have a lot of formal training in caregiving. Some agencies provide a lot of um, training. Others have people that are not quite as well trained. Um, some, if they are funded under Medicaid, um, they have to be approved by the state in order to get paid through Medicaid. And they're typically, depending upon the state, they're not licensed nor are they closely monitored by the state unless they have Medicaid funding. If they have Medicaid funding, they do. So these are ones where you're pretty much on your own to check them out, to be aware, know whether their workers are bonded, whether they're licensed, whether they have insurance, all those kinds of things. Okay, next. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to Kathy, who's going to go through the questions. And okay. Okay, thank you. And thanks, Tom, James, and Linda. Your presentations were amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, so far, we just have one question that was directed to James from Becky Franklin. Uh, is there currently a wait list for care management services? And is there an assessment to determine eligibility for that? Or can anyone use that service? Great, thanks uh, Becky for that question. No, right now there is not a wait list uh, for care management services in the uh, MARC service area, which um, for our area agency on aging, um, it combines the five Missouri counties in the Kansas City metropolitan region. Um, as folks enter uh, our system of referral, uh, we administer a screening instrument uh, to kind of assess initial risk, and then a more in-depth assessment is conducted uh, to round out a risk assessment. Um, and that helps us prioritize those who would be referred to care management. Um, and Mark is joining with area agencies on aging across the state of Missouri to have a more standardized assessment, um, which is actually just being rolled out right now. Um, so that, that happens after the referral. Um, also, if you want to refer to Mark outside of our information and referral line for services, uh, we are now registered for some service lines, including care management, under the Healthify uh, social health referral platform. So if your um, hospital or a provider group or insurance company um, is a partner with Healthify, that's a platform that you can make referrals through to us. Okay, this was a, um, a question that someone who I'm assuming is from Illinois uh, commented about just how awesome the Link for Care 
website uh, resource is, Linda, and asked if there was a similar site available in Illinois. Uh, not that I know of. There is a United Way in Illinois does have a site in the Chicago area, I believe. Um, so they have a site for a lot of the nonprofit information. Um, but I'm not aware of any out there that are quite as comprehensive or like, or there's probably some that are similar to Link for Care. Um, there are a number of organizations now putting up sites. Uh, they tend to be more national in scope and they tend to be linked into what we're calling these referral systems that, that health systems are buying into. So where you can link the um, information about providers into your electronic medical record system, you can make referrals and then you can follow the loop and see if people in fact got the services. Um, and some of those have uh, like Aunt Bertha's Health Spy have, have directories that are out there and available. They're pretty skimpy at this point. It really depends on the part of the country. It depends upon where you are and how much they've focused in on that. So uh, for other kinds of sites that are more marketing sites but do have information on them on caring.com or a place for mom, um, things like that are available just about anywhere, but again, it really depends upon the area as to how comprehensive they are. Okay, and we just had a question from our friend Karen in uh, from Shepherd Center, Kansas City, Kansas, for Linda. Some agencies may provide the same service, so how are you um, doing like due diligence as far as um, knowing which agencies, uh, the, the quality of the services for each agency? Okay, right now we are not vetting organizations or agencies according to quality. I know that's a big issue. We go, you know, we've gone around and around about it. We do have a disclaimer on the site that um, we are not recommending necessarily any of these, and it's kind of up to the due diligence of the individual uh, who is looking for the services to check out those services. We do ask questions, for example, depending upon the relevance of it, about whether they have bonded workers, what the training is for their workers, for example, um, are workers volunteers or are they, um, are, are they employees of the organization? Uh, does that in organization have insurance? A lot of those kinds of questions that will help people get to that. We do some checking on that. So we do spot check to see if in fact they're giving us accurate information. If people do not give us accurate information or we have some real questions about a provider, um, we will take them off the site. Okay, thank you, Linda. And James, could uh, might you repeat the health resource that you included in your presentation? Yes, and I'm uh, typing that into the chat now, so I'll send that so everyone can have it written. Uh, but the social health referral platform that we are listed on for some service lines is the Healthify platform. Um, and that largely is for professionals whose organizations have uh, partnered with Healthify for that purpose. Um, but I believe also the public can make, uh, make those referrals through the platform. Thank you, Jane. And Tom, um, we have a question asking if you might elaborate more on how your organization partners with businesses and donating their computers. Sure, that's a great question. And uh, we prefer to refer to it not as donating computers, but um, as uh, partnering with PCs for People to collect and recycle their IT assets. The reason for the distinction is, you know, most businesses or large organizations, they have to budget every year for the turnover and recycling of devices anyway. And most of them work with for-profit recyclers to do that. Uh, and we have to partner with a lot of for-profits to, to make the work that we do um, kind of viable and, and acceptable throughout the, the region. Uh, the benefit of working with us, as I said, is we don't charge any fees. Um, and the kind of double benefit to the organization is the community impact that results from us redistributing the usable computers. So we actually have an account team uh, and, and we're constantly working at 
on outreach to develop any kind of warm leads and develop them into um, great relationships. And sometimes it takes anywhere from three to 12 months for an organization to finally decide to, to work with us and, and make their IT equipment available to us. Um, and, and that's why, as I mentioned in part of my comments, how important it, it is for our group to have uh, obtained the necessary certifications for safe destruction of data. Because the most important thing about computers is, um, you know, the propensity for cybersecurity breaches to occur. Um, and I didn't mention that, but cybersecurity is the number one biggest crime in the world in terms of economic impact. So for us to do what we do, um, we had to invest quite a bit in um, the audit process to make sure that we are uh, we're on the same level of certification for um, data destruction as any for-profit recycling business. And so now that we've achieved that, we're working hard uh, to spread the word among organizations about why um, working with us can provide the double benefit of no fees to the businesses as well as community impact uh, for the, commun uh, the computers that we redistribute. Just a quick mention, and I, I did have a chance to privately answer the, the question from the uh, Illinois uh, resident about what we're doing there. But just three days ago, the governor of Illinois uh, announced a very large uh, grant from philanthropic funds they have in Illinois to agencies that are making uh, technology and other services more readily available to those who are affected by the pandemic. And PCs for People is one of seven agencies that uh, received a large grant and um, uh, access to over 10,000 computers that we're gonna be picking up from government agencies throughout Illinois, mainly because the, the service area that we're starting in is Metro East St. Louis, which is actually the, one of the lowest income cities in the state of Illinois. Um, but we're leveraging that for the work we're doing with the governor of Missouri and the governor of Kansas um, so that we can also get access to the um, state government storehouses of computers uh, in both Missouri and Kansas as well. Um, as I mentioned, this pandemic has put a spotlight on this issue in ways that we could have never imagined. Um, so uh, you're gonna be seeing and hearing more from PCs for People when it comes to our outreach to businesses and, and governments and healthcare organizations who have uh, IT assets that they need to recycle every year. So anyway, great question, thank you. And Tom, we're so fortunate that you are so connected across the country because that's a, a value to us here in the Kansas City region. There also is a question uh, that Linda has asked, is there an age limit on the computers you take? No, we'll take, because the, the nice thing about what we do is, uh, the model that we adopted with PCs for People is around both recycling and reuse. So anything that is too old to be, um, you know, to get a, a new operating system and, and to take kind of the newer batteries and things like that, we're able to break down uh, and recycle responsibly. There's not a single item that we bring into our warehouse that ever goes into a landfill. Uh, if we can't reuse it, then we recycle it with, um, with certified recyclers who make sure that the end of life of every component um, is reused in some way, shape, or form. So yeah, it doesn't matter how old the devices are, we're, we're able to take them off your hands. There are a couple of things that we require a fee for just because of the extra cost of recycling. Things like you know large TVs or CRT monitors, because they have a lot of gases in them and it costs extra to extract those gases. Um, printers uh, that have lots of plastics on them. Um, we, we charge a, a small fee to take those items off your hand, but anything that's electronic computer wise, um, we will take for no charge. Um, and it, it's very, very helpful to our mission. So Tom, here's another um, for you from Mark from Southwest Missouri, who, um, Asked how did you fund setting up the operation and getting certified for data destruction? He would like to do something similar if it's not competition for PCs for people. 
No, I just, uh, I, I can see the chat here. It looks like Mark. Uh, yeah, just get in touch with me. Uh, I, I put my email address on there. Um, we are welcoming uh, organizations who want to take this on, particularly in, in more uh, remote areas that haven't had this service. Um, there is a national group called AFTER, which is the Alliance for Technology Refurbishing and Reuse. Um, and I will, I'll get you that information so we can uh, work on helping you get that set up. Tom, I don't recall if this was on one of your slides, but I've seen a video that you showed about, um, that was so cute and so impactful about um, donating equipment. So if, was that on your slide? And if not, could you just give the address that folks could see this video? Sure. There, uh, well, there's, there's a number of good videos. The, the best site to go to really is pcsforpeople.org. Uh, just P-C-S-F-O-R-P-E-O-P-L-E.org. And uh, we've, got, uh, we've got both our corporate video that explains the process, as well as a number of kind of anecdotal uh, videos that have been posted uh, on our social media. And uh, that's uh, the, the other thing is to go to Connecting for Good, Connecting for Good's Facebook page, because we are still maintaining the Connecting for Good brand name until the end of this year. So if you go onto Facebook and, uh, and look up Connecting for Good, we, have, uh, we do have some pretty cute videos there about um, uh, uh, computer donations as well. And we have uh, our friend Renee from New Jersey is asking if you might share the after information with us. So if you're able to type in the chat, if there's a website or where we all might go to learn more about the after sure. uh, resource. It's, it's uh, AFTRR uh, is the name of the organization. And it's, uh, sorry, it's a, uh, it's a group that was created by a foundation uh, upon whose board I sit as a vice president. And it's a foundation called the National Christina Foundation. I'm gonna put that in the chat as well. It's part of the National Christina Foundation. That's Christina without an H. Um, and uh, if you just type in National Christina Foundation, it has a, uh, an online tool uh, that makes, uh, makes it uh, easy for anyone that has excess technology to make it available. And anyone who needs technology, whether it's for people with disabilities or uh, you know, seniors, anyone, you can create a kind of a match. Uh, it's a very cool website. Um, and then AFTER is a group that formed uh, for individuals like the one in Southwest Missouri who want to get involved in actually doing this as their own venture. So a lot of good information there. And Tom, I don't know if you see Kathy's question uh, asking if individuals might donate old computers or is this just for businesses to donate? No, it, it, definitely individuals can donate. We have two centers in Kansas City, Missouri. We're open Monday through Friday from 10 to 4 and Saturdays from 9 to 2. So anything that is kind of less than 10 devices, um, you can bring in on your own to either of our centers. Um, and, um, and then if it's 10 devices or more, you can contact us and we can arrange for a pickup. They have to be usable computers um, uh, for us to, to, to do a pickup. But if you've got some things you, can, you wanna just load in your car, uh, and we have a center over at the Linwood Presbyterian Church, um, as well as our, our warehouse, which is in the West Bottoms. And I'll be happy to put both of those addresses on the chat, on the chat site. Great. So uh, there's, I think, a couple more minutes, maybe five more minutes, if people want to put in questions. If not, Linda, if I can just take the liberty of asking you and James and Tom when he's done putting in this, if there's one more um, piece of information that you wished you might have shared, if you thought you had another minute in your presentation. While we wait to see, oh, and Tom also, if, are you taking nooks and tablets? Yep, absolutely. So Linda, is there anything else that you would have put in if you thought you had more time? 
just in response to the question about um, differences among organizations and at any time as a provider, if you find an organization that's on our site that there have been major issues with, um, we would appreciate you letting us know that um, because we do, that's about as far as we will go in terms of trying to vet organizations because we just cannot do that. Um, but um, we would appreciate from providers if you've had um, some definitely bad experiences to let us know about that. Okay, James, any final comments or thoughts from you? Well, I, I encourage, and I know we have a lot of uh, national participants uh, today, so that's wonderful. Uh, but especially for the folks who are in the Kansas City region, uh, you know, really get to know your colleagues and colleague organizations in the aging and individuals with disabilities space. Um, it, it, attend meetings like this, um, try to collaborate as much as you can, and it will make your referrals uh, much higher quality and, and much better. So uh, get, get involved and those referrals will increase. Tom. Uh, Kathy, I, I've already, I think, taken way more time than I probably deserved. So I just want to appreciate everyone who joined this uh, this session and uh, hopefully the information we've provided uh, can give you some actionable uh, steps that you can take to help the older adults that you're working with throughout your your day and, and also in your your personal lives so just uh, thank you for having me hey Linda turning it back to you okay okay well thank you all I really appreciate um, Tom and James your presentations today I uh, appreciate you all being on and asking great questions. So um, it's now break time. Your next session, Reframing, Reframing Aging During COVID-19, will begin promptly at 1030. And just a reminder that you do have a different Zoom link for that. And it's included in your registration confirmation and in the chat box. Thank you all. Have a good weekend. <laughs>